All right, and we're recording as well. Excellent. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna give it just a minute or two for folks to join in and then we'll get started. Very exciting. And for those of you that are just joining and are queued up, um, try out the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little icon that says chat and type in the name of the city that you are in right now. Where are you tuning in from? Anybody from California? I ask because I grew up in a little town called Cupertino. Sandra, do you know Cupertino, California? I do not. Where is that? Um, it's in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's the home of Apple computers. So if anybody says, oh, I've heard of Cupertino, because when they changed their clock on their iPhone, it... Uh... Bobby Reed, are you from, uh, from Cupertino? If you can type into the chat. Is chat live? Somebody test it out. Let's see if it works. Karen DuPont has raised her hand. Excellent, Karen. Jamie, is the um, chat feature available to people in a, in a webinar? Or maybe that's where the Q&A has to happen. Ah, Jamie said yes. Excellent. Hey, Tim, glad you're joining us. Excellent, Florida, excellent, they're coming in. It's working now, thank you, Bobby. Woodside, excellent. Well, I went to, um, not too far away, St. Francis High School um, in Mountain View, California. My dad worked at the Geological Survey, Steve Foster in Menlo Park, California, you might know that. M from Washington, my wife is from Olympia, Washington. We've got them coast to coast, Maryland, and some people from Tennessee, we have a Nashville person dialing in. They probably could have just driven over. Come join me. Sit in the studio. Excellent. So exciting to see these names, these people dialed in. Not allowed on campus. No, and neither am I actually. So we were just mentioning, Sandra and I were talking about the last, I've been on campus, I think twice since March. Um, so everything I've been doing. Ah, and from Romania, that must be the Petkus. Your daughter Mara is my class. I'm assuming that's who it is. Salute to Romania. It is Laura Petku. Mara is an exceptional student. So glad to have her in the class. The 30A on the Florida Panhandle. I've been there. We were staying in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and we drove down to um, 30A. Can't remember the name of the donut shop or the ice cream shop. Thank you for your hello, Laura. Sandra, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Sorry, rookie mistake there. Thank <laughs> you everyone for joining us. Um, Dr. Van Jack, um, it's a privilege to have you here with us today. I do wanna share that um, my colleagues have shared with me that you have um, won the last lecture um, vote um, for um, the seniors. Um, each year they vote on um, the faculty member they would like to hear um, uh, as their last lecture of their senior year, um, advice and just, you know, words of wisdom before they leave. And um, you have won that twice. And um, I know that we're in for a treat. Um, a little introduction, um, Dr. Andy Van Schack is a professor at Vanderbilt University with appointments in the Peabody College of Education and the School of Engineering. He teaches courses in social science research methods, judgment and analytic reasoning, and technology forecasting. He has also founded and served as chief scientist for several technology companies in Silicon Valley and Tokyo, Japan, where he earned 15 patents for inv inventions related to adaptive learning systems and digital pins technologies. And in 2017, he was the recipient of the Madison Surratt Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, which is Vanderbilt University's Teacher of the Year Award. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Sandra, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm sure that some of you are parents of students who I've had in classes in the past or may currently have. So it's 
great to have you here. I, I normally like to do these things in person, as I'm sure you would like to as well. So we'd have a little bit of time to chat and get to know each other. Um, but it's great to be here and I really appreciate um, that invitation to come speak with you. I have a couple of options available for you. So I thought I'd do a little polling to see what you would like to do. Um, and so here is a poll. What would you like to learn about today? So let me describe this to you before you vote. I have one lecture called The Last Great Human Invention, How to Predict and Plan for the Future. And that one comes from my course in technology forecasting in the School of Engineering. The second one's called How We Know What Isn't So, Cognitive Illusions and How to Overcome Them. That's a course that I teach at the Peabody College of Education. That's kind of a combination of applied cognitive psychology and Microsoft Excel. I'm not gonna be doing too much with Microsoft Excel today. So the first one's really about predicting the future and how can we do that accurately? I wanna prepare your students for the future. So I wanna teach them how to figure out what's gonna happen. And then the second one's kind of fun because it really relates to how we um, are subject to certain cognitive illusions and ways that we think. And so my job as a professor is not to teach your children what to think, it's to teach them how to think. And then a combination of the two, you can't decide. So you go with surf and turf, right? So you can get a little, a sampler. So why don't you go ahead and vote now if you would please. And I'll let you decide what it is that you'd like to hear about today. Normally I don't allow my students to decide <laughs> what the topics of the lectures are gonna be uh, week to week. They do make some decisions about what we do during the course of the class to give them a little bit of flexibility and engagement. Um, and it looks like as the votes are coming in, uh, it's not too close. You want to hear a combination of the two. Uh, for those of you who just want to hear the first or hear the second, um, I'm sorry, you're going to get a little bit of what you want by hearing that content, but we're going to hear a little bit of both. So we're going to end that poll. And I can share the results with you so you can tell I'm telling the truth. I like to do polling in my classes, just like we're doing right now, um, to find out what students are thinking about and find out what their opinions are. And that helps me to shape and adjust how I lecture moving forward. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of both, surf and turf. And so the first part of this will be called The Last Great Human Invention, How to Predict and Plan for the Future. So here's a question that I ask on the final exam for the class. What technology do you think will change the world as much in the next 25 years as computers and the internet have over the last 25 years, right? So what do you think is gonna change the world? And that's a question I ask on the final exam because frankly speaking, at the end of the semester, I wanna know what students think. They have some really interesting ideas. Now, when you think back 25 years, look at this image from 1995. And you might remember that if you're my age, I'm 55 years old and have uh, kids in and out of college. Uh, there's a video cassette recorder, there's a tape recorder, there's a little television, there's a VCR. That was 25 years ago. Um, companies like Google, Yahoo, Netflix weren't even around 25 years ago. And what I'm asking you to think about is what's gonna change the world in the year 2045, right? What's that technology going to be? Now here's some choices. And you can type some uh, ideas into the chat if you'd like. I'd love to hear what you have as I go through this. Robots, I don't know if you're familiar with Boston Dynamics, but look at that robot leaping over. It's, it's not to the point now where they're stumbling. They're actually doing Olympic style events as gymnasts or a little mini spot down there. We have the four legged variety. Sometimes robots have wheels. And so you could think of an autonomous vehicle, a car that can drive itself would be an example of a robot. Um, those things I think are gonna change dramatically a lot of jobs. Uh, Hyundai and Uber, uh, some graduates from Vanderbilt University are running the Uber Elevate project. That's an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that will take you from city center to the airport in just a few minutes. And those things also will be autonomous. Uh, virtual and augmented reality, super cool technology on the left. We have the Oculus Rift and on the right we have uh, Magic Leap. That's a company that raised $1.5 billion in venture capital to create um, mixed reality. So that's kind of some pretty cool technology. Brain computer interfaces. I'm gonna be mentioning e Elon Musk's name a couple times during the presentation. This idea that you could put tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of electrodes right directly into the brain and communicate to create cognitive prosthetics to help people who are losing their memory or help with vision or even offload other types of cognitive processing. That would have some pretty significant implications. 
Uh, synthetic biology, what used to be called genetic engineering, the ability to slice and dice DNA. In fact, uh, Nobel Prizes for CRISPR technologies are related to this, where we can produce new types of foods and fuels and pharmaceuticals. Uh, once you can do that with DNA, though, you can also do genetic trait selection. And interestingly, I should mention, the class is actually called Technology Forecasting and Assessment. The assessment component is, what are the ethical implications of some of these technology developments? Uh, and what good could happen, what bad could happen, and how can we as engineers um, think early on about what we can do to reduce the risks, negative consequences of genetic trait selection, for instance. Uh, reusable rockets, these rockets are actually landing, not taking off. SpaceX has a number of different rockets, and, and because they're reusable, it's a lot less expensive to get um, payloads up into orbit. For instance, Another Elon Musk company is a company called Starlink. They have over 700 satellites in low Earth orbit right now. They're going to provide internet connectivity to people around the world. So those television commercials where you say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You're going to be in the middle of Timbuk3 and be able to connect at one gigabit um, per second, very fast rates with super low latency, 30 milliseconds maybe to get around the globe. So super high bandwidth, super low latency, uh, internet connectivity for everyone around the world. Great stuff. Uh, maybe not in the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, internet of Things. Put a microprocessor into everything, which we kind of already have. If you think about the microprocessors in your phone, there's probably 20 microprocessors in your cars, in your microwaves, in your ovens, in your wristwatches. And when those uh, computers can talk to each other, they can help automate a lot of the things that are happening in your life. Blockchain which is a type of distributed le uh, ledger, uh, is going to represent itself in a lot of different ways. Bitcoin is one example, a new type of way of exchanging currency or exchanging money, buying and selling online directly. You don't need to go through a trusted inter intermediary like a bank, but that trusted intermediary idea will also disrupt a lot of other industries. Uh, synthetic food, this is uh, something that students are interested in. There's something called Beyond Meat, and I actually had a taste test in one of my classes. When these Beyond Meat burgers first came out, I uh, had my students follow me like ducklings over to the Freshman Commons. And I had the chefs there grill up some standard hamburgers and these synthetic hamburgers, basically produced from um, vegetable proteins. And we had a little taste test. Uh, and you could definitely tell which ones back years ago were the uh, veggie burgers, but they're getting better and better. Huel is just basically a bunch of different chemicals you can buy off the shelf and turn it into a powder and mix it up like Carnation, Carnation Instant Breakfast or Ensure that produces all the vitamins and minerals and calories you need. And then uh, there are companies that are producing synthetic wine. Molecular gastronomy is this idea that you can actually just take ethyl alcohol, some uh, different molecules that have flavorings, uh, textures to them and produce wine which I'm sure is gonna cause some people to roll their eyes, but it's a lot less expensive and it's better for the environment. So there's different types of synthetic food. Green energy, of course, we need to have energy to produce all of these things. We've got wind power, we've got solar power, we have hydro, nuclear power is actually considered to be a green energy by many. It's um, very, very safe. Um, and uh, so different sources of energy. Artificial intelligence, the idea that our computers are getting smarter and smarter, and maybe someday like HAL 9000 from 2001 Space Odyssey, Jarvis from Iron Man, Samantha from a movie called Her, we can have computers that are as smart or smarter than we are. And I'll share some data with you a little bit later in this presentation about what's gonna happen with that. And if you combine computers with robots, you have either Lost in Space, 1967, uh, Star Wars 1977, Star Trek Next Generation uh, 1987, and then Dolores from Westworld more like 2007, 30 years later. And notice how our representation of robots is becoming increasingly more lifelike as our technologies are improving. And I could go on and on, uh, and I do in my class where we could talk about the fourth industrial revolution and all these different types of technologies that are going to change the world. So let me ask you, and type this into the chat. What technology do you think will change the world as much in the next 25 years as computers and the internet have over the last 25? Some people have typed in hydrogen cars. Interesting, that's kind of a fuel source, a way of shifting energy from one location to another. Um, brain implants, I think, are gonna be fantastic to allow quicker interaction with our computers. 
artificial intelligence. Exoskeletons, great for paralyzed patients to allow full mobility and actually provide enhanced mobility uh, to people. Uh, smart cars that drive themselves, I think for sure is gonna have an impact. And then cloning is just an example of synthetic biology or a kind of a genetic engineering. And we can go on and on. And really, I don't know exactly what the answer is. My inclination is to believe that it's going to be artificial intelligence. I used to say thin, synthetic biology, but I say artificial intelligence, and this is just one person's opinion, because when computers are as smart as humans are, we're gonna ask them to design the next generation of computers that are even smarter than them. And then when they do that, we're gonna ask them to solve some of these other problems that relate to synthetic biology or relate to hydrogen power sources or new types of um, fuels or fo foods or pharmaceuticals. And so when I say the last great human invention is this idea that if we can invent computers that are smarter than humans, and then we can get a lot of them, we can have them do some of our inventing for us. And of course, there are significant implications associated with that and consequences. So Peter Drucker, who's a fam famous management consultant, uh, the founder of Modern Management said, trying to predict the future is like trying to drive down a country road at night with no lights while looking out the back window. Um, I would like to have a beer with Peter Drucker and say, I think you can actually do better than that. I think we can, uh, with the running lights on and driving a little bit slowly, I think we can get down that country road. So what I'd like to do uh, for this first part of this presentation is share with you the methods that I teach my students on how to predict the future. Because if you can predict the future, you can be part of creating it. I'm going to talk about four different technology forecasting methods. It typically takes me an entire semester to get through these. We spent a couple of weeks on each one. So I've got about a minute or two to spend on each one. So I'm going to be moving pretty quickly, uh, but it's going to give you sort of a taste of the kinds of things we talk about. William Gibson, who's a famous science fiction author, said the future is even or is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So one way to kind of predict the future is just to look around you and see if you can find indications of what's on the cutting edge. One of the challenges with what's called monitoring is, as you know, the internet is like drinking out of a four inch fire hose. It's just way too much information. Or once you get all that information, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, right? And so what I wanna teach students is that technology goes through different stages of development from original scientific discovery through laboratory feasibility of some maybe new application of it they get some prototypes operating and then develop some beta tests, get them out in the market for early adopters. And then ultimately, if the technology works well and solves real problems, you see widespread adoption. And ultimately, that technology is used in ways that the original inventor couldn't even imagine. And then later, people talk about the social and economic impact. I think what's interesting is that for each one of these stages of technological development, there are different sources of information, different people talking about them, writing about them. So original scientific research is typically funded by organizations like the National Science Foundation, right? National Institutes of Health, sometimes by private organizations, um, funding agencies. Uh, R&D labs, oftentimes whether they're universities or they're commercial uh, R&D labs publish some of their findings. Typically they like to race to get them out to conference proceedings. It's much faster to get something presented at a conference than it is in a peer reviewed publication. So sometimes I look for conference proceedings. Competitions by DARPA, which is uh, a Department of Defense organization, will have competitions just like um, uh, different uh, private organizations uh, have different kinds of funding for competitions. Academic journals, of course, there's thousands of them and they publish hundreds of thousands, millions of articles every year. And then when products move into the commercial sector, they get patented often. And one fun fact about the patent database is that um, patent applications are published in the United States 18 months after they've been filed. So whether the product has made it to the market yet or not, 18 months after a patent has been filed, you can read the patent, uh, the patent application. And so sometimes you can see products a year before they actually get out the market by looking at the patent database. And then finally, there's industry white papers and media. So my job as a professor is to teach these students strategies to be more efficient in drinking from that four inch fire hose and finding the needle in the haystack. So you wanna recognize that future technologies exist in some form today. Um, based upon their stage of development, you kind of know where to look. You can certainly leverage the work of other researchers, other people who are monitoring technology. And 
um, watch the watchers and recognize that the monitoring approach to technology forecasting is really the foundation that feeds in the information for the other techniques I'm gonna to talk to you about now. The second is called the Delphi method. So James Surowiecki, who wrote a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, said paradoxically, the best way for a group to be smart is for each person in it to think and act as independently as possible. So we gotta be very careful about taking advantage of something called synergy, because if we put a bunch of people in the group at the same time, oftentimes there's a number of different biases that come into play, like groupthink, that actually uh, make it worse to get the opinions of experts. Um, but the Delphi method was, let me just hop forward just a little bit, was developed by RAND. Uh, RAND is short for Research and Development. They're a think tank. And way back in the early 1950s, they developed this method. It was devised in order to obtain the most reliable consensus of a group of experts by subjecting them to a series of questionnaires in depth, interspersed with controlled opinion feedback which is a long run on sentence. I would probably ask my students to break that up and simplify that a little bit. But basically what they developed was a four round system where the moderator identifies a theme. Let's talk about hydrogen cars or brain implants, finds a bunch of experts in that area and says, what do you think we could forecast? You're the experts, not me. What should we predict? Then they come back with a whole list of events. I consolidate them as the moderator and I send out a questionnaire. I ask the experts to predict on what date will each of these things happen? They send their predictions into me. I run some statistics. I come up with a median. I come up with what's called the interquartile range. What's where are most of the people, 50% of the people are in the middle. That identifies who the outliers are. And I send that back out to the experts. And I say, now with this information coming from everybody else anonymously, you have the chance to update your forecast. Would you like to do it? And if you are an outlier, you need to provide some justification for your outlying uh, estimate. Then they send back their new estimates with their new justifications and explanations. And I can solve that information and I produce a report. It's really that easy. And now with the internet and with email, it can be done pretty simply. It's done online. And this is an example of what happened when they did this back in 1951. Now it was classified until 1962 because one of the questions they were asking is, Taking the point of view of a Soviet strategic planner, how many atomic bombs would be required to reduce the output of the United States munitions by 75%, right? And they had no idea, right? We don't know how many nuclear weapons the Soviet Union has. And initially in that first round on the far left-hand side, you can see that one respondent was way down at 50, another one was way up at 5,000, right? Um, that's two orders of magnitude different. Um, but through the iteration and through this feedback that they had, they were able to get it down to a two to one ratio. And ultimately they had an answer that was actually pretty accurate. So the key concepts of the Delphi method is you collect information from a panel of experts, two heads are better than one, five heads are better than two. If you can avoid the biases associated with groups of people in the room at the same time. And you can do that using anonymous questionnaires with controlled feedback and statistical analysis and in iterating through multiple rounds, you can develop that convergence. So both the monitoring and the Delphi approaches are kind of qualitative methods for forecasting the future. Uh, and here is an, an estimate with respect to the Delphi forecast about artificial intelligence. Experts expect that between the year 2040 and 2050, high level machine intelligence will be more likely than not. And in the study, they define high level machine intelligence as intelligence equal to that of a human. So in what year will we have a computer that's as smart as a human being at just about anything a human can do? I mean, already computers are smarter than us about doing calculations, right? My little calculator on my phone is, that's my beautiful wife. My, uh, my phone is way better than me at math. It's way better than me at chess. Um, but let's say it could be way better than me at the kinds of things your kids might be doing for work in the year 2040, 2050. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Why, what implications does AI have in terms of education and what we're teaching people? So this is one estimate that came out of a Delphi um, questionnaire. Okay, method number three is called trend extrapolation. Uh, Jim Barksdale, Silicon Valley, former Netscape CEO said, if we have data, let's go with that. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. And this is what we want to protect our CEOs from. We want to give them lots of data so that we produce more objective analytic decisions. 
right? And so let me tell you where this all comes from. This idea of trend forecasting really came from early observations about growth curves. Growth curves, for instance, of this cow and this cow's weight. You can see that from birth up through about 250 weeks, this cow has gone from about 100 kilograms up to about 700 kilograms. And this is the cow's weight over time. But if we use a mathematical function and we do a best shape curve or best fit curve, we're gonna have a logarithmic growth um, function. And this would be one that I could use to predict weight for other cows. Another cow comes in the barn, it's 50 weeks old, I'm gonna guess that it weighs about 300 kilograms, and if it continues on in its current uh, fashion, it will grow to a particular weight at 250 weeks. And that's what growth curves look like for your children. I'm sure with your sons and daughters, you might remember they were saying they're in the 90th percentile or the 110th percentile of height and weight. That's just another example of a growth curve. But interestingly, if we create this dimensionless horizontal and vertical axis, so we're basically standardizing pigs and rabbits and shrimp and salmon and crows on the same scale. So dogs live, you know, every year of a dog's life is seven years of a human's life or something like that. I learned that when I was a kid. So let's say dogs have a lifespan of 100%. Humans have a lifespan of 100%, whether that's 14 years or 80 years, that's the horizontal axis. And then the ultimate mass of the human or of the dog or of the pig or the shrew. And what you'll see is growth is very similar across all of these animals. And so what we're looking at are underlying phenomenon that we can characterize mathematically and then we can use forecasting or trend extrapolation by analogy between things we do know and things that we're projecting into the future. So a big part of this class and this unit is teaching students about the different types of mathematical functions that characterize phenomenon that we see in the world, whether they be medical or financial or has to do with market size or speed or heat or whatever it is. Logarithmic increases. Here's a Porsche Carrera acceleration curve, super zippy car, through, goes through six gears. And the neat thing about trends is we can extrapolate. If that car did have a seventh gear, then it would probably get up to about 250 miles an hour, but it would take about 60 seconds. And so maybe the designers at Porsche said, well, uh, going 230 miles an hour is probably plenty fast. Tires pretty, probably couldn't handle too much more than that anyway. Exponential increase, you probably hear about exponential growth. You have to be very careful about that though. In just a second, I'm gonna show you an S-shaped curve, a logistic function. A lot of growth initially looks exponential, like with the growth of pandemics but it doesn't grow forever. But we can use an exponential function to characterize a lot of growth. For instance, cumulative global installed solar photovoltaic cells. That's a mouthful. But how much energy are we producing with solar power and solar power like photovoltaic cells? And you see that growing exponentially. And one reason is because the cost is decreasing exponentially, right? So this is the price of silicon photovoltaic cells, dollars per watt. You see it's declining very, very quickly. So you kind of would expect as volumes increase, economies of scale reduces price, and as price continues to be reduced, then people install it more, and it's just kind of a virtuous cycle. And so we see that a lot, exponential increases and exponential decreases. This is that logistic function that I was talking to you about, also called an S curve, because obviously it looks like the letter S. And you see this for a lot of different growth patterns. Uh, one that I like, I studied aeronautical engineering as an undergrad, of all things, propeller-driven aircraft speed. Way back in the early 1900s, the Wright brothers had an airplane that could fly probably about 20 miles an hour, maybe 30 miles an hour, cloth, fabric, wires, a lot of drag. Um, but then over time, they were able to use struts instead of wires, and they changed from fabric covering to wood and then ultimately to metal which is stronger and lighter and smoother. But ultimately there is a limit to how fast aircraft with propellers can go. And really what's interesting about it around the beginning of World War II, aircraft got about as fast, propeller driven aircraft got about as fast as they're ever gonna go. And it's because as propeller driven aircraft go through the air, to go any faster, the propellers have to spin faster. But the tips of the propellers start to go faster than the speed of sound, which creates a lot of drag, and a lot of vibration and things start to fall apart. 
So it wasn't until jet engines were created that they were able to break through this particular barrier. And so I teach my students that they can predict breakthroughs. A breakthrough is just some sort of a limit to the capabilities of a particular technology because of chemistry or physics or maybe financial markets or something. But some new technology that comes along that doesn't have that same limit can exceed them. That's called a breakthrough technology. And so you can predict breakthroughs. You know when the next thing is going to happen. Uh, this is a logistic model for 17 different cases. So again, um, mathematicians have come up with ways of characterizing S-shaped curves mathematically, and then your job is to determine what those coefficients are to characterize it for the data that you have or model the data that you have. And this one's kind of interesting also. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Vanderbilt family or the Ingram family, excuse me, uh, made a lot of money off of shipping. The Ingram family donates a lot of money to Vanderbilt University. Thank you very much. And they used to ship things using canals, right? Using ships and water. And so back in the late 1700s through the early to mid 1800s, lots of canals were produced. But at some point, people said canals are kind of too expensive to produce and we've got this new thing called locomotives. So they started producing railroads in the mid 1800s. And so more and more railroads were produced until after a while they said, you know what, it's even cheaper yet to build roads. Let's build roads in an interstate commerce system um, with trucks and automobiles. And so lots and lots of roads were produced. And then people said, wow, it's really great to ship things overseas, uh, ship things around the United States using aircraft. And what's interesting about this is we see this 55 year gap between canals, railways, roads, and airways. And so it's fun for my students to think about, and you can give us some thought also, but only for a few seconds, what's next? right? Airplanes are not the end of it. So what are we seeing early indications? Remember the technology of the future exists today. It's just not evenly distributed. There should be something already in existence that's going to be the next big thing. John Walsh says drones, potentially, right? Having autonomous aircraft moving things around. Um, this is the curve we're looking for. Doug's got it right. Space travel, SpaceX, but Doug, they're not gonna be going out into space. They're gonna stay in low earth orbit. And so here's a rocket uh, nicknamed BFR, which stands for big rocket. I'll let you fill in the blank. Um, this is produced by SpaceX. They're actually manufacturing this right now. They're doing test flights. Uh, this, this carries as many passengers as the largest intercontinental jumbo jets do. And this spacecraft can launch from one spot on the globe and get to any other spot in less than an hour. In fact, between some of the major cities, it's only gonna be about 30 minutes. So imagine purchasing a ticket for the price of a little bit less than business class, getting aboard one of these rocket ships, and then finding yourself in Shanghai less than an hour later. Fly to Shanghai, grab some lunch, get a meeting or two, and get back in time for uh, your kid's hockey practice. Um, so we're going to see some new technology, and this is my bet on that one. So we can talk about barriers to continuation of trends, which I did, physical and chemical properties, social factors, resource constraints. So students need to think a lot about not just curve fitting and just projecting an exponential function out into infinity, but thinking what are the, fact, uh, the factors that could influence either the um, adoption and enhancing it or diminishing it moving into the future. And if we get a mathematical model that's really sophisticated, we actually can do things like modeling, modeling climate change, modeling pandemics. Uh, this is a topic for another class that I teach, but students produce calculators like this and able to model pandemics, things like that. So the key concepts for trend extrapolation is that trends often continue into the future. It's important to determine what the underlying factors are that helps to determine the type of mathematical function we wanna to use to model them. Uh, but we also have to very carefully characterize external factors that could alter trends. And those are things that go beyond just the technology itself, but to the human factors like legal, political, ethical, and social factors. And that's when we bring in scenario development. This is the fourth and last one. You can see I'm moving fast. Scenario development, uh, let's listen to Seneca from a couple thousand years ago. He said, whoever does not know how to take care of the future and the present will depend upon the uncertainties of that very future. Right, and we do not want to be reacting to things in life. We want to be proactive, 
And when I think about preparing your daughters and sons for the future, I want to help them create a vision for the future, a vision for their future, and to take steps now to position themselves to be in the right place at the right time. And scenario forecasting is a great way to do it. It's a five-step process. Again, it takes a couple of weeks to get through this unit, but I'll give it to you in about a couple of minutes. The first thing you do is you analyze the external factors that you think could influence the diffusion of the technology you're interested in, right? Like space travel or drones or grown human organs or cognitive prosthetics, right? What external factors, social, technological, economic, ecological, political, legal, ethical, I memorized it because I teach my students the mnemonic steeple. Once you know steeple, you can rattle those off just as fast as I did. And so they think about those external factors that can influence the adoption of a technology. They're looking for two of them that are both very impactful, but very uncertain. And then what you do is you map two of those factors against each other, like maybe technological progress, really fast or really slow, social acceptance, very high or very low, and when you create a two by two matrix of those two factors and two levels, you create four possible futures. Technology that's advancing quickly and people love it. That's a very bright vision for the future. How about technology advances very slowly and, stu and people don't want it? That creates a very slow progression. And so you can imagine there's four different possible futures that you're trying to predict or that you're assuming are going to happen. You select one of those, justify it. Why are you picking this one? Because you think it's most likely or this is the one that's the most dangerous for your organization. And then you do a very conventional SWOT analysis. I'm sure many of you have heard of SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I teach my students they need to do them in toes order. Threats and opportunities first because strengths and weaknesses inside your organization are only strengths and weaknesses in the context of threats and opportunities. But they get down the SWOT matrix and then they take that information and you do what's called a toes analysis and they create what I call a strategy matrix. They map strengths against opportunities. Wow, we're strong and it's an opportunity. That's bread and butter business. Weaknesses against opportunities. We're not very good at that, but there's a great opportunity in the marketplace. Maybe we should invest, take advantage of it. And you can imagine you could do the same thing with weaknesses and opportunities and weaknesses and threats. And then finally, from that strategy matrix, they can provide specific actionable recommendations to a decision maker in their organization. So you move from step one, which is the world's crazy, who knows what's gonna happen, to here is a particular scenario I think that's going to happen, here's our organization in the future and the opportunities that are available to us, and here's what we can do today, playing chess a few moves ahead, to prepare ourselves to be in the right place at the right time to take advantage of it. That's what scenario development allows you to do. And scenario development is based upon data that comes in from monitoring, Delphi, and trend. That's why it comes at the end of the semester. Students in class, you can imagine this is a very exciting day in class, um, put together this uh, handwritten version of, the, of this five-step process, and then they go home and type it up. And this is an example of what a paper looks like in one of the classes that I teach. In the engineering course, students have to produce four of these, and then they combine those four into a combined matrix at the end of the semester. So this is the kind of work they're producing. I think it looks great in form and obviously in substance. Scenarios can be presented as vignettes, oftentimes in terms of science fiction stories. That's where science fiction comes from. They're essentially scenarios. So the key concepts of scenarios is they're pictures of the future. They leverage information gathered using the other forecasting methods. They're developed based upon the interactions of uncertain external factors. It's a multi-step process that's transparent, it's repeatable, and you can get your senior staff involved in it. Allow them to bring their assumptions in so that they're involved in the process, they're more likely to buy into the conclusions. And the great thing is they produce specific actionable recommendations. I want your students to be strategic in the organizations that they're going to. I want them to add value. And no one's gonna ask them to do this. Very few organizations do this kind of work, but imagine if they did this on their own. And then they said, hey, to their boss, I'd love to take you out for lunch, a cup of coffee, I'd like to share some ideas I have. And it might get their boss thinking about them a little bit differently. So I wanna finish this part of the lecture by telling you something to Walter Gretzky. You might recognize the name Gretzky. Walter is best known as the father and first coach of Wayne Gretzky, a very famous hockey player. 
Walter Gretzky said, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been, right? So what I want your students to be thinking about if they take my class, love to have them, is where is the future going to be in five or 10 years? What can you be doing now to prepare yourself for it and skate to that spot? Be there when the time comes to create those opportunities. And one of the things that I did, and this is my segue into the second part of the presentation, is knowing that technologies are coming that are going to change business, change society, change the types of jobs that are going to be available. I started looking for research on what those jobs would be and what skills workers needed to have to do those jobs. And fortunately, there's a really great book called The Future of Skills. Google that. Uh, it was produced by Oxford Martin and Pearson and Nesta, some really smart folks. And they did exactly all the things that I've just talked about, predicting in the future of technologies and the businesses that will result in the changes to society and jobs, and said, these are the kind of skills workers need to have. And number one on the list is judgment and decision-making. Now, the other ideas are interesting too, fluency of ideas, active learning, learning strategies, originality, and so forth. But when I saw that very first one, I said to my, one of my colleagues, I'm going to create a class called Judgment and Decision Making. I have no idea what's going to be in it, um, but that's what I think our students need to know. So what I did is I started to do a lot of research. What are they doing at Stanford and MIT and University of Cucamonga? What syllabi can I find? What is it people are reading? What are they doing? What does it mean to have judgment and decision-making abilities? And so I created a brand new class and it's offered in the Department of Human and Organizational Development, HOD 3300, and it's half cognitive psychology and half Microsoft Excel because our students need to have tool skills. And not just I can pass a Microsoft certification exam, but I can use Excel as a tool to support human information processing, right? And so I created that course. And so my next lecture, and let me jump over to that. If you have any questions and you wanna jump into chat while I switch gears, um, I'm gonna present a little bit of information from that class. Dun, 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 dun. Let's see if I did that correctly. It's going to take a second for this to pop up. Um, and when it does, hello again. So this lecture is called, oh, the name of the book is, now I've forgotten, The Future of Skills. The Future of Skills. If you just Google that, it's free online. I wouldn't go to Amazon to get it. This one's called How We Know It Isn't So. I borrowed the name from a book by Thomas Gilovich. If you like um, books that talk about Dan Airely's um, Predictably Irrational, uh, Dubner and Levitt's, what's the name of the book? Around the tip of my tongue. I know you're saying it. Somebody type it in the chat. Oh, around the tip of my tongue. Uh, how We Know It Isn't So. It's a great book about how humans think and how we sometimes don't think correctly about things. Cognitive illusions and how to overcome them. So I think that you know uh, this dress. Have you seen this dress before? This was kind of cool about a year or two ago. Everyone looked at the dress. When I first saw this dress, it looked white and gold to me. Now, normally what I do is this is where I do a poll and I would ask students, um, but I won't do that right now. It looked white and gold to me, but when I came back and took a look at it a day or two later, I would have sworn on a stack of Holy Scripture that it was uh, white and gold instead of black and blue, excuse me. I thought, it was, I thought it was white and gold, then it looked black and blue. And this is really strange. This is an optical illusion. It fools a lot of people. When I show this in class, there's a big uproar in the class. Students can't believe somebody sees it as black and blue because they would swear it was white and gold. They think for sure it's the dress on the right. Some people think it's a dress like the one on the left. Two people can see the exact same thing but perceive it very differently. And that's what an optical illusion is. And so what I wanted to do was explain to them why this happens. So it turns out if you have a blue and black dress, like on the left, in yellow light, it still looks like a blue and black dress, but kind of with a little yellow light on it. Or I could have a white and gold dress in a blue shadow. I still understand it to be a black, or I'm, I'm sorry, a white and gold dress, but it looks a little kind of like it's got a bluish cast. But if you combine these images, it's both the exact same dress. And so what your brain is trying to do is make sense of it. Is this a white and gold dress in a blue shadow or is it a blue and black dress in a yellow light? 
And depending upon how your brain works and how your neurons are wired together, and that's based upon prior experience, you'll see it differently. And there's a lot of things in life that are like that. Optical illusions, but also cognitive illusions, the ways that we think about information. And so that's really the premise of this book, Judgment and Decision Making. So there's that book, uh, The Future of Skills. All right, so here's a question for you. And everything I'm gonna present to you over the next few minutes, and I'm gonna move quickly, is all a matter of fact. If a woman's mammogram is positive, what's the likelihood that she has cancer? If a woman's mammogram is positive, what's the likelihood she has cancer? Is it 100%, 90%, 50%, or is it less than 10%? Right, well, let me give you a little bit of information that will allow you to actually perform the calculation instead of using your gut. Mammograms are 90% accurate in spotting those who have cancer. It's called the sensitivity of the test. And they're 93% accurate in spotting those who don't have cancer. That's called the specificity of the test. And it turns out that about 0.8% or eight women out of 1,000 who get routine mammograms have cancer. That's called the prevalence of the disease. Now, knowing the sensitivity of 90%, the specificity at 93%, and the prevalence of eight in a thousand, what's the likelihood a woman has cancer if she tests positive on her mammogram? And when you ask this of people, including doctors, most people guess about 90%. But the correct answer is less than 10%. Now, I would very much expect you to be thinking, BS, Van Schack, that just can't be right. How could that be the case? Why would we use mammograms if only 10% of the time that you've got a positive test result, you actually have cancer? And so this is a type of cognitive illusion. What's happening is your brain is saying to you that the probability that you have cancer if you get a positive test result is equal to the probability that you get a positive test result if you have cancer. And indeed, this does apply to, to COVID. We'll talk about that in a second. So thank you for thinking ahead, Richard. And this is not the case. And I wouldn't expect you to intuitively understand this, but I do expect students in my class to learn about this. And when they come upon a problem just like this, whether it's mammograms or it's COVID testing, they say, my gut is gonna tell me the wrong answer. That's why I'm gonna pull out my Excel spreadsheet and do some calculations to figure out what the correct answer actually is. And so here's what we do. I teach them about Bayes' theorem. And I'm not gonna go through the equations with you because you don't need to know the equations. By the way, Sir Harold Jeffries, who kind of looks like he would be a statistician, mathematician, geophysicist, and astronomer, said Bayes' theorem is to the theory of probability what the Pythagorean theorem is to geometry. So if you still remember a squared plus b squared equals c squared, um, then you remember the Pythagorean theorem. But probably you didn't learn about Bayes' theorem, which may have more real-life utility than the Pythagorean theorem. And so here's the four possibilities. You have cancer and you either test positive or negative for it. You don't have cancer and you either test positive or negative for it. And so that's a true positive if you have cancer and you test positive, a true negative if you don't have cancer and you test negative. Those are green because the test gives us good data that's correct. But if I don't have cancer and I test positive, that's a false positive. If I do have cancer and I get a negative test, that's a false negative. Sometimes this is called a hit, a false alarm, a miss, or a correct rejection. You may have heard of false alarms. So if I enter the information into the, my little spreadsheet, if you will, then I know that eight women out of 1,000 have cancer. This column needs to add up to eight. I know that this one then, therefore, is going to add up to 992. This is the sum of all women who have cancer, the sum of all women who don't have cancer, and these add up to 1,000. That's the prevalence. My sensitivity is 90%. So 90% of eight is 7.2, but there's no 0.2 women. So we're gonna call it seven. Get an accurate test result. The test is 90% accurate. I can find seven women out of eight who have cancer. And it can also, and I fill in the one there, it can also find people who don't have it accurately. 93% of the time, 93% of 992 is 923. That's correct. But it's also gonna produce some False alarms, I don't have cancer, but it says I do. And then when we add seven plus 69, we get 
76, one plus 923 is 924, and then we do the math. The question is, if a woman gets a positive test result on, uh, for cancer, what's the likelihood she actually has cancer? It's seven out of 76, 9%. That's where the answer comes from. And if you're saying to yourself, this doesn't seem reasonable, this doesn't seem intuitive, um, then you're in great company. In just a minute, I'll tell you what Kahneman says about that. So what do you do if you do get a positive test result from a mammogram? The answer is keep calm if you can and get a second opinion. It's not because you don't like your doctor. It's not because your HMO is not good. It's not because the test isn't as good as it can be. But if you go back and get a second test, even if it's the exact same test, you can increase that positive predictive value. And let me show you how to do that. So initially, we know that eight women out of a thousand have cancer, but now things are changing. The new question is, what is the prevalence of cancer among women who have tested positive with a mammogram? And this is what Bayesian statistics is all about, being able to update your estimates based upon new data that's come in. I have new data, I have a test result, and I can use the results of those tests to update my model, essentially. And so now I can run the numbers again. But instead of a prevalence of 0.8%, it's now 9%. So I put my 90 here, my 910 there, and I'm gonna fill in all these numbers. And can you guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna be higher than 9%, wouldn't you say? But how much higher? My intuition is not gonna give me the correct answer. I can just tell you, but I can do the math. And the answer is 56%. Now the other answer to this is typically, when you take another test after a first positive indication, you typically take a more expensive test. And the test that's more expensive has higher sensitivity, higher specificity. And so you get a more accurate result. And then oftentimes you have data that comes from other sources, right? You can do a genetic test and determine whether or not you have a predisposition towards it. And so Daniel Kahneman, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Princeton University, rock star, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. He said, it came as a shock to me when I realized I was never taught how to use Bayesian statistics and that even now I find it unnatural to do so. So my expectation should be, you're probably thinking, Van Schaak sure talks fast. He went through that example very, very quickly. Normally I would spend an entire class period on this, Normally students will have read about Bayesian statistics and watched a video before they even showed up in the classroom. And then there would be a lot of time for us to go through it. Then students take what they've learned and then they write a paper on it, applying Bayesian statistics to things that go beyond mammograms. And even at the end of that, I tell them it still shouldn't be intuitive. It still should be challenging to think about, but that's why we're gonna use Excel to help it do some, some of the thinking. So what are some other applications to this? Well, you could use it for home pregnancy tests, right? You can imagine you're pregnant or you're not, and the test indicates positive or negative. But what's the sensitivity of a home pregnancy test? What's its specificity? What is the prevalence of pregnancy around, among women your age or of the age of the person taking the test? And so, and then what would you do if you got a positive indication? What would you do if you did a negative indication? You'd buy two of these tests, right? And then see if that changes your results. So students like to hear about this one. The center example there is a uh, metal detector at an airport, right? They give false alarms. They miss things that go by. Drug testing, right? So imagine peeing in a cup and then you give it a, hand it over to your employer or the NCAA and say, do I test positive for marijuana or for steroids? And so, this is another example where students need to understand what does a positive test result mean? Is there a possibility of false alarms? What would you do? And it turns out what the NCAA does is when somebody provides them with a specimen, they pour it into two bottles, label it A and B. If a person tests, an athlete tests positive for A, they run B through the test as well because we know that cranks up the positive predictive value. Two positive tests, yeah, that's probably a positive indication, but a positive and negative, then things are a whole lot different. And then I ask students, what are some other examples of play, ways that you could use Bayesian statistics beyond simple medical tests? Because this could be a prostate exam or this could be an MRI or it could be something else. 
One student wrote a paper about umpires in baseball calling balls and strikes. Um, and the, it is either a ball, it's either a, or a strike, but they perceive it differently. What's the sensitivity of an umpire? What's the specificity of an umpire? What's the prevalence of strikes in Major League Baseball? And then, of course, we have Lady Liberty here and justice um, juries, right? Somebody's guilty, somebody's innocent. They either committed the crime or they didn't commit the crime. Uh, let's say we're going to pick a very simple kind of crime that's either you did or you didn't. There's no gray area, but the jury either finds them guilty or not guilty. What's the sensitivity and specificity of a jury? What's the prevalence of the crimes among the individuals who this person is a representative or a, a, an individual within the population? So there's lots of applications. And so what students in this class do is they learn about things like Bayes' theorem. And again, I go more slowly. I recognize I've had math more recently than you have. Um, they actually produce a calculator in Microsoft Excel. This is one of the first exercises because it's pretty straightforward. If you know Excel, you could probably put together this uh, Excel spreadsheet yourself. It's just a bunch of cells with some formulas in it, not a lot of conditional formatting. We're not doing pivot tables yet or VLOOKUP tables, no Monte Carlo simulations, all things that we do in the class later. Uh, but they produce this calculator and do a lot of what if analysis. They try to gain an intuitive sense about what happens when you crank up the sensitivity, what happens when you increase the specificity, what happens if you change the prevalence, how does that affect that positive predictive value? And then once they have this, they write a paper that looks like this. Students in my class are given 10 topics. Bayes' theorem is one, uh, risk is another, investment traps is another one, um, multi-attribute choice, Lots of interesting topics to write about. They can pick any seven that they'd like to write about. And they write these two-page papers that explain the cognitive illusion. It talks about the theorem, like Bayes' theorem, and it talks about its application to a real problem. And then they use their Excel spreadsheet to do some calculations. And my objective for your son or daughter who's in my class is to learn how to use Excel, right? And actually out of the class, they get certified by Microsoft at the expert level. So rather than just writing on their resume, proficient in Microsoft Office, they can say, I'm certified at the expert level in Excel. And the employer should say, that's interesting. What have you used Excel for? They say, oh, I'm glad you asked. And they talk about one of the papers they wrote. They show them this paper, which I think looks really pretty professional. And they say, here's how I can use Excel as a tool to support judgment and analytical reasoning. That skill that we know is gonna be so important for them in the future. So what the thought I'd like to leave you with, and then we have a little bit of time um, for question and answers. And I realize I've been doing a lot of talking and very quickly. Margaret Mead, who's a cultural anthropologist said, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. And I wanna assure you that I know what my role is as a professor. My role of a, as a professor is to look into the future and to see the kinds of things your children need to be learning the skills they need to have, the knowledge, the dispositions they need to have, and to prepare them, not just to be great workers, but to be great citizens, be great coaches, be great parents, make good evidence-based decisions that once their heart tells them what to do, their mind tells them how to be effective and efficient in doing it. And so I create courses. One of my favorite quotes is, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. And although I explain Bayesian statistics very, very quickly, um, I think I try to explain things in ways that are simple, not simple-minded, but in ways that students understand. They apply it to problems that are of interest to them, and they produce tangible evidence of skills, um, both in terms of certification and papers, and hopefully things that they share with you over the dinner table when they come home at vacation. So uh, the name of the courses, in case you asked and Margaret asked, uh, uh, the first course I teach uh, in the School of Engineering is called Engineering Management, ENGM 3300, Technology Forecasting. St any student can take it. You don't need to have any math skills. It's not a bunch of nerdy engineers, which is what I used to be. It's kind of half engineers, half non-engineers. Most students take it senior year. Uh, and then the other course is in the Department of Human and Organizational Development. And that course is called Judgment and Analytical Reasoning. That's HOD 3300, same number. Coincidence, not my favorite number, um, HOD 3300. It's an elective course. 
It used to be that calculus was required to get a degree in HOD. Um, and I said, you know what? I think analytical reasoning is what is really required, not just calculus. So it took a lot of wrangling over a year or two and actually got this course to count on par with calculus to satisfy a new analytical reasoning requirement. All right, Sandra and Jamie, uh, it's 2.58. Um, can we, do we wanna open it up for questions or do you wanna hear some humorous anecdotes about my, my children, my family? Sandra said, thank you, Dr. Van Schack and everyone for joining us. We hope to see everyone at the conversation with the chancellor event tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, that sounds like it would be exciting. I will, Jamie, if you leave this open, um, I will leave, I will stay online. Is that okay? And then answer some questions that people have? Or how do you want to handle that? Can you pop in and unmute and talk? Oh, and unfortunately, Lucky, the golden doodle, is not here, so I can't show you Lucky again, but I'd love to share, you, share my Lucky, Lucky the dog. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I hope I have the privilege of working with your son or your daughter uh, at some point in the future. Um, you are more than welcome to stay on. Okay. So one of the questions was, how long have I been teaching these courses and have I seen some predictions come true? You know what is a heartbreaker? I have my PowerPoint presentation from 10 years ago when I talked about Bitcoin. And any of you know what Bitcoin is, are going to, their heart's gonna break as well. I was teaching about Bitcoin where one Bitcoin sold for a little bit less than a dollar. I told students, you should buy some Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin went up to like $17,000. Um, I didn't uh, cash in on that one. But what I, what I do tell students is, I would have sold every Bitcoin I had when it went to $10 or 100. 10X return or 100X return on your investment is, is doing obviously very well. Um, thank you for all the kind words and your thanks. I've been teaching at Vanderbilt University for 17 years, 34 semesters. Uh, I've been teaching the technology forecasting class for about 10 years and this new course, Judgment and Analytical Reasoning for about two years. So it's a relatively new course. Um, hopefully students are looking for skills like Microsoft Excel, um, but learning Excel in the context of um, real world problems. They say there are lies, damn lies and statistics. How do you suggest your students interpret the statement? You know, it's easier to lie with words than it is with statistics. One of the, uh, one of the things I do, so thank you for that question, um, Laura. One of the things that I do is I show students a graph of some data and I say, your job is to interpret this graph in the most positive way possible, or your job is to interpret this graph in the most negative way possible. What could you say that's true by cherry picking data, right? Um, I do lots of examples in class where they show them two different ways to take a look at data and how the way that you look at the world, I, I tell students, seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. And if we have previously held beliefs, we oftentimes through confirmation bias, only look for things that confirm what we already believe. And we discard information that doesn't. And so um, lies, damn lies and statistics for sure. Uh, I embrace that. And I wanna, I always talk about uh, how they can use their powers for good or powers for evil. And I always show them the tricky way that you can use it for evil, but mostly to protect them from people who might try to fool them. Uh, John Walsh asks, what field of engineering is engineering management 3300? It's engineering management. So it's the department of general engineering. So it's not mechanical, it's not civil, it's not electrical, it's not computer science, uh, it's engineering management. Uh, but any student can take it as an elective, whether you're an engineering um, major or not. Uh, so for sure, yeah, any student can take that. How do you adjust for personal risk tolerances and preferences and the outcomes of analytical judgment processes you just shared? Absolutely great question. Uh, one of my lectures is on risk. It's a major unit in that course in judgment and analytical reasoning. And we talk about this idea of uh, risk tolerance. And we talk about how to think about risk analytically uh, in terms of its risk is more than just a hazard and exposure. It oftentimes has to do with the consequences and what are the costs of those consequences. So we definitely talk about that more, that, that value laden component to the analytic process. And that's why I talked to them about it. It's really important to get the buy-in of the shareholders. Who's your audience for your analysis? 
how do they view things? Um, obviously, um, Ramesh, that's a really complex question. It's a lot of fun. Wish we had a little bit more time to get into it. Christina says, my daughter's interested in a field called human factor psychology. One of my favorites. So I'm super excited, but it's having a hard time finding companies that need them. Oh my gosh. Who doesn't need human factor psychology? I'd probably call it something different. Uh, human factor psychology, uh, human factors is really putting humans in the loop of something in an aircraft, in an assembly line. Um, and then it's the psychology of it is, see, that's the part that's caused me to like spin just a little bit. Uh, thinking about human as kind of part of that machine. And that's really what the fourth industrial revolution is about, this connection between humans and these computing systems. I think of AI wranglers is something that uh, Christina, your daughter will be doing. So I would look at this as something in product marketing, uh, in product design, user experience, UX, UI, user interface. Uh, I've worked, and as Sandra mentioned, I've been the chief scientist, or maybe she didn't mention it, for a number of different companies. And my role was always to do this, human factors, cognitive psychology, applied to product design, product development. So Christina, please ask your daughter to connect with me. I know it's weird. It's gonna be awkward for her. Dear Dr. Vanchak, you have no idea who I am, but my mom said I should contact you. And I'd love to have a Zoom chat with her. Um, she can connect with me on LinkedIn and take a look at the companies I'm associated with in Silicon Valley uh, to see if there's some company that might be of interest to her, but I'd be happy to chat with her. And the same goes for any other parent whose kids are uh, at Vanderbilt, they can always contact me. Um, Bobby Reed adds, Sandra, just FYI, I believe the time was changed. Oh, first the chancellor's talk tomorrow, but I don't remember seeing an announcement about the change. Woof. Christine, I'm glad you got that message. Please do have your daughter check in with me. Andy from Vandy, she can find me. In fact, there's my email address. I'm kind of proud of myself, Jamie. <laughs> I actually had a slide with my email address. Like a big boy. I'm very proud of you. This has been phenomenal. And I will say for anyone who's still listening, tomorrow's um, chancellor lecture is at 10 a.m. The time was changed due to the scheduling of the football game. The kickoff for the game was at 11. So we pushed the lecture back um, to 10 a.m. And a reminder just went out to folks. Um, well, it will go out at four o'clock central today. And you'll also get a reminder tomorrow. So I apologize if you didn't receive the time change, but yes, it is in fact 10 a.m. Central tomorrow. Cool, thank you. And thank you for the kind words, Steve. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the lecture. I feel like it went pretty fast. Went a little bit fast. Normally uh, I go, I, I, I downshift about third gear during class. Students break up into breakout sessions. If any parent has a, a question too about what we're doing, to shift from face-to-face -face instruction to online instruction. It's one of my um, favorite topics. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, as I was mentioning to Sandra and Jamie prior to launching this webinar, um, I spent the entire summer doing research on rapport, um, connectedness between professors and students in online environments and ensuring that I create classrooms where students feel connected to each other. Uh, I think it's, Taking a course online is a lot more than just saying, oh, I'm gonna to have to use Zoom and figure out how to put my face down in the corner. Um, uh, and so a lot of it has to do with the human factors, right? What uh, was being asked about earlier, about how students know that I care about them, right? How do they know that? How important is that to them? Um, how can I can create an environment that's a little bit less stressful than the standard uh, environment? Because I know you're, you're boys and girls, I was gonna say your sons and daughters, I should have said, are, have a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Um, they're sad, they wanna be connected to students in class and at sporting events and with their fraternity. It doesn't feel the same. Uh, and I can't affect a lot of things that happen outside of the classroom, but I can certainly have, affect what happens in the classroom. So most of what I do, I've kind of got the content down. Uh, I have a PhD in instructional technology, so I kind of got the technology part down. I spent all of my time as a professor thinking about connectedness with my students, relevance of the content, and making sure that they understand that um, what they're learning in the class has real world practical applications, and that they know that I care that they do well. 
Uh, Jamie asked if the lecture will be available online in a few weeks. Actually, one thing I did, Jamie, too, is um, I rehearsed these lectures last night. Um, and so I've recorded them. I can put them up on YouTube, and I will um, for the public. It'll be called How We Know It Isn't So. And the other one is called, um, what, was my, what was my first one, my first lecture called? You'd think I would remember. It's about predicting and planning for the future. Anyway, so I've got them on YouTube, and then I know that, Jamie, you're recording this one, so this will be available. How will they find it? We are going to, hi everybody, this is Jamie. We are going to put up um, a landing page with all of the Dean Hour lectures that are happening in the next two weeks, as well as this, as well as the discussion with the Chancellor that's being recorded tomorrow. And those will all go on a website and we will send out an email with links to all of that. It, it'll be a YouTube um, landing page, I believe, that has all the recordings. Yeah, in fact, um, one's calling, I'm gonna type it in, the last, Great Human Invention. Is that what the first one's called? The Last Great Human Invention and How We Know What Isn't Isn't So. So that'll be up there as well. There we go. All right, there's still 61 participants. It's hard for me to believe that people are still logged in. Um, I don't have any other inspirational words of wisdom. If someone has a specific question, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. So, oh, Laura, you have your hand raised, but I don't know how you can speak. But Laura, I know that you are the mother of Mara. And I did tell her that I was going to give her a little shout out um, to you because you're dialing in. Um, she really is a very, very bright and positive spirit. She was one of the, so one of the things I do in my class, I have a hundred students in an online class. Students sign up to be what I call the featured students. So nine students video images show and I interact with them during class. And it feels like a small group seminar because I'm calling on students by name um, and they're going back and forth. Then students break up into small groups into breakout sessions. So they have a chance to interact with each other. But Mara was one of the featured students today in class. And so that's why I know her name. Or if you take yourself on, off mute, you can perhaps speak with me. Someone asked if I've done any forecasting related to the upcoming election. Um, you know, one of my favorite things is making sure that students at the end of the semester have no idea what my political affiliation is. Um, you didn't ask me about that, but I do try to be very, very careful in the spirit of teaching students how to think and not what to think. I don't want them to know what religion I am. I don't want to, want to know what my political affiliation is. Um, uh, with respect to um, political elections, you know, there's a number of different methods that we could use, but polling is probably one of the best ones, exit polls. Uh, so I just watch what it is that you watch. What we talked about in today in class is making sure that we have a representative sample of the population we want to generalize the results to. So in class, we talk about how is it that polls can indicate one president's, one candidate's going to win, but yet the other one wins. What happened? Why are those off? Um, and it has to do with sampling. And it has to do with the ways people respond to questions of that type. Um, what are some other ones? What are some of your learnings for teaching virtual? Um, teaching virtual, make sure you get the technology down, right, for sure. Um, I post a lot more information than I normally do. Every Saturday morning, I send out an email to the class saying, here's what's coming up this week. So students want more reminders about what's going to happen than just looking at the syllabus. Uh, I make sure to um, use more polling than I did today in class. So lots of polling so students feel engaged throughout class. Students use the chat feature a lot. Um, and then I break people up into small groups and I have them come back and report. They type into a Google Doc. So while they're working in their breakout session, I'm observing them type into their Google Docs as opposed to Zoom where I can drop in on their breakout rooms. That's a little creepy. Nobody likes a parent who opens up the door and sticks their head in, says, what are you guys doing? Um, so there's a lot of little things that I think add up to um, a smooth running class. So Christina says, thank you so much, Dr. Van Schack. I will suggest my Vanny sophomore reach out to you. He's struggling on whether to remain an engineering major or go in a different direction. Love to chat with him. Those are the conversations I really like to have with students. And we can talk about what an engineering degree will do for you. Um, 
and what other majors are available at Vanderbilt University that kind of allow him to take classes he's really passionate about, but will ultimately result in him getting a good job, which is always good. Um, yes, the book is Freakonomics. Thank you so much, John, for reminding me what that book is by Dubner and Levitt. Usually I remember the name of the book and I forget the authors. Um, this time I forgot the name of the book. What am I forecasting for COVID? I will not be teaching face-to-face um, -face next semester, I can tell you that much. Um, any class that's taught with more than 100 students is taught online, and I have some pre-existing conditions. So um, I don't wanna give you too much information, but with my heart and uh, an autoimmune disorder, so now I've given you all the information, it's probably not safe for me to be in a room with 100 sophomores, right, during cold and flu season. So, um, I expect this to continue on for quite some time. I think we will have, by the time this is over, more than 400,000 people will have passed away in the United States as a result of COVID. Um, take a look at the data from the 1918 pandemic and watch that second wave. Um, what do you see as some of the most significant broad areas where people make errors in understanding data? Wow, Bobby, um, let's grab a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or a beer or something because we could spend a lot of time with that. Um, the classic errors are confirmation bias. People want information to confirm what they already believe. But in terms of processing data, um, it's that they're not even really using data to make good decisions. So one of my lectures is on choice. Um, there's a great book called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. It's by Kahneman and Tversky. And Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for it. They don't provide it uh, posthumously, so Tversky didn't get it. In my class, I teach students how to think quickly. They learn algorithms to think very, very fast and frugal, and they pick the one that they like the best. But then I teach them a very slow approach that uses, it requires Microsoft Excel um, called multi-attribute choice, um, where they weight factors and they use z-scores and other kinds of fun mathematical things um, to make choices about where should I go to graduate school? Um, where should I you know, get a job? Um, should I purchase this home or which of these homes or these apartments should I rent? Um, and then they practice thinking about a problem that they care about using a fast, frugal heuristic. They get 30 seconds to make a decision and then they get 30 minutes to put together their spreadsheet and make it slow and then see what the difference is between the two. So uh, take a look at my syllabus if you can get access to it about um, the other kinds of things we talk about in the class. You mentioned S-curve applications to pandemics. Can you please elaborate? Sure. Um, if you start predicting a pandemic and you see the growth of individuals who either, either get it or die of it, it almost always increases exponentially. And people will take an exponential curve, y equals a, you know, a to the x, or y equals b, a constant or a coefficient times um, uh, a to the x, and they'll project an exponential growth. Uh, and in theory, it will continue to grow exponentially, but there's some limit, right? There's only 7.5 billion people on the planet. It can't go into the trillions, right? So you know there's some uh, capacity with respect to the number of people that could actually get it. It has to taper off at some point. And it usually doesn't do it until 100% of the people that get it. So you have to decide how many, what percentage of the people in the population will actually contract or die of the disease. So you know it's going to be an S-curve, not exponential. The first part of the curve is exponential, but then it's going to flatten out at some point, and that's what we try to predict. And so I talk to students about how you make estimates about that curvature, that angle, this curvature, and the asymptote, if that makes sense. And each one of those is one of the coefficients in that logistic function. And so there's ways of making predictions about that. So, um, yeah, pandemics start off exponentially, but they always turn into S-curves. And if you hear anyone talk about exponential growth in something, it's pretty sexy. Um, but every exponent has some ending to it, even Moore's Law. Kathy J says, thank you so much. You're welcome very much. Christian says, thank you, Dr. Van Schack, about human factors. Distance learning has involved significantly more reading outside of class to gather information. Any ideas for students with dyslexia or their learning differences? Um, it can involve more reading. Mine involves more video. So what I do is I have two parts to my course. There is a, and I'm not speaking for the thousands of professors at Vanderbilt University, Christian, I recognize that. Um, but what I do is Wednesday is asynchronous. So there is a reading, there is a video, 
and there's some quiz questions. And I want them to be thinking because I want them to come into class knowing some stuff. And class is about saying, now let's apply that stuff. Let's make sure you have a good understanding, but we're gonna go into little breakout groups and I'm gonna have you practice. You can get some feedback in those breakout groups, your peers can teach you because sometimes I don't get it right, right? I'm a parent just like you. I can try to explain things to my kids. It makes perfect sense to me. They don't get it. But one of the kids explains it to the, one of the other kids and now it suddenly makes total sense. And then each class, I have my asynchronous work. Then they come to class and we practice and then it leads to an assignment. So it's guided practice and then what's called independent practice. Right? And then that all leads up to a big project at the very end where you get to take all of these different components they learned about during the semester and do a big project where you get to combine them. So with students with dyslexia or other learning differences, um, if you have a documented disability, one of the accommodations at Vanderbilt University for something like dyslexia is to get anything that's written um, recorded into audio where you can use a screen reader like JAWS. So sometimes people like to listen as they read um, I need to know a little bit more. One of my favorite areas, by the way, is special education. Uh, I got a grant from the National Science Foundation years ago to develop tools to support students who are blind and accessing um, spatial information. So I love the idea of um, neuro differences. Some people, there's a lot of different names for it, but um, working with students and making sure to accommodate the disabilities. Let me add something that I think a lot of parents will be interested in knowing. Um, about 12% of my students have some documented disability that um, provides them an accommodation, right, under ADA. So they get time and a half, they get notes um, provided to them, um, all sorts of things like that, a quiet uh, testing environment. And when I took my course online, I very specifically designed it to provide the kinds of accommodations that are provided to students that need them to all students, that's called universal design. And so I don't have a single student this semester out of the 200 that I teach who requires any accommodation than what I do for every student. So one of the things you can tell I'm kind of proud of, it probably sounds a little immodest, I apologize. I'm really proud of designing a course using principles of universal design that mean that all students are on the same level playing field, right? Um, so that's one of the benefits of taking a course online. If you design them correctly, you don't need to provide additional accommodations to, for some students. Uh, Ramesh gives me a triple exclamation point. Thank you. That's awesome. That's two more than I need. One is fine, but I appreciate that. Um, all right. We still have 47 people online. I think 47 people went off and uh, took off. So I'll say this. Thank you, Jamie, for that prompt. Um, th thank you, Jamie, for your support during today's webinar. Thank you, Sandra, for the kind invitation to come speak with the parents. I wish I could have done it in person, um, but we do the best with what, what we have. And so please do think of me as a professor that you can contact at any point in the future. Um, all I have to say is I saw you during that presentation. I have a quick question I wanna ask about my son or daughter, about something that has to do with Vanderbilt. I'll do the very best I can to answer that question whether it's related to my class or not. If you think your son or daughter could benefit from one of my classes or something that I have been talking about today, please have them contact me. It's not weird. I have students contacting me all the time. So with that, I will say thank you very much. And I hope you all enjoy this great um, family weekend. Thank you, John Walsh. And I will do my best to say thank you. Uh, stay healthy. All right. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>